Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I want to thank SBIA for arranging this workshop on such an important topic, and to all of you for joining us from different parts of the world. Today, I will talk about API manufacturing facility inspections. Though I will primarily focus on surveillance inspections, many of the aspects that I plan to discuss will be applicable to other types of inspections as well. During the next 25 minutes, I plan to discuss FDA's regulatory authority and expectations regarding GMPs for API manufacturing, risk factors that we take into account for selecting sites for inspections, different types of inspections that we conduct. Over time, I have seen a lot of interest and questions about how to respond to 483. So I will spend some time in discussing what FDA 483 is, when it is issued, and how you should respond if you receive one. And lastly, I will share some thematic data based on the analysis of our recent actions and discuss two of the most important ones that we often encounter at API facilities. The FDNC Act, as amended, does not distinguish between APIs and finished pharmaceuticals. The term drug includes both APIs and finished drug products, among other things. The Act requires that all drugs be manufactured, processed, packed, or held in accordance with GMPs. Failure of either a drug product manufacturer or API manufacturer to comply with GMPs constitutes a violation of the Act. As GMP requirements set forth in Part 211 are intended to apply for the preparation for finished dosage form, FDA considers the expectations outlined in Q7 in determining whether APIs are manufactured in accordance with CGMPs. Global production of pharmaceutical products and ingredients has become an everyday reality. Globalization of drug manufacturing adds new complexities to the U.S. supply chain. APIs may be manufactured in one country, shipped to another country for final manufacturing that incorporates ingredient from a third country. This is a real scenario. The finished product is then imported to the U.S. As of December 2019, more than 70% of the API manufacturing facilities supplying the U.S. market were located overseas. The number of registered overseas drug manufacturing facilities continue to increase every year. To keep pace with the globalization, FDA has established an efficient, nimble and modern framework to help assure that all drugs, no matter where manufactured, meet the same high quality standards. Our inspections and surveillance of manufacturing facilities are an integral part of assuring that all drugs, whether domestically manufactured or imported, meet the same high quality standards, regardless of where they are manufactured. FDA prioritizes inspections of sites regardless of their locations. So before 2012, the Act, or the FDNC Act, required FDA to inspect domestic drug manufacturing sites every two years. There was there were no such time frame for foreign drug manufacturing sites. The shift to overseas production of U.S. goods, as I just described earlier, including the drugs and their component, predominantly occurred in early 2000. This resulted in large imbalance in which facilities were inspected. So FDESHA changed the requirements for FDA to inspect domestic and foreign drug manufacturing sites in accordance with a risk-based schedule. With the passage of FDESHA, FDA's drug inspection program shifted from one focused heavily on U.S.-based facilities through the early 2000s to a program that since 2015 has conducted more foreign than domestic drug inspections. The site selection model is at the core of FDA's surveillance inspection prioritization program and ensures a uniform approach for domestic and foreign facility inspections. The agency uses the model to calculate a score 
for every facility in its catalog using risk-based factors. Um, those are represented on the right-hand side, and I will talk about them one by one. Um, three factors I consider fairly static, inherent product risk, facility type, and patient exposure. So inherent product risk, different types of product carry different product, different levels of risk based on the characteristics such as dosage form, route of administration, or whether the product is intended to be sterile. So for example, a manufacturing facility that makes sterile API may have a higher inherent product risk than a facility that may make non-sterile API. Facility type, the risk levels can vary depending on the operations that a facility performs. For example, a facility that manufactures API is higher in risk than a facility that only repacks API. A patient exposure. The more products a facility manufactures, the more likely a patient is to encounter products made at that facility. This refers to both number and types of product manufactured. A facility that manufactures many products will have a, a higher exposure factor than a facility that makes fewer products. Now, the dynamic factors, inspection history. If a facility that has not met established quality standards when previously inspected is considered higher risk than those that have met standards in the past. Time since last inspection. As the time since a facility was last inspected increases, the risk that it may not meet established quality standards increases and the, so does the need for the inspection and the hazard signals. Events such as product recalls or manufacturers or patients reports of quality problems associated with the facility increase the risk score when compared with facilities that have fewer or no major hazard signals. So what types of inspections we conduct? We conduct predominantly three types, pre-approval inspection. These are conducted as part of the review of an application to market a new brand or generic drug. And this would include various types of facilities included in the overall manufacturing process, including API suppliers. Surveillance inspections. These are our main bread and butter. We use this to monitor the manufacturing processes and periodically quality of the distributed drug. FDA uses the findings to evaluate when a manufacturer is complying with CGMPs. In general, the agency does not announce domestic surveillance inspections to the company in advance, but announces international surveillance inspection. Whether inspections are announced often depend on particular cases and the history of specific facility. And finally, full cost inspection. These are triggered when FDA has reason to believe that a facility has serious manufacturing quality problems or when FDA wants to evaluate corrections that have been made to address previous violations. Full cost inspections can be announced or unannounced, whether domestic or international, depending on the specific situation. So what is a 483? Once an investigator or a team of investigators conclude a facility inspection, they document any objectionable conditions or as we call it observations on a form called FDA 483. The form is then presented to the most responsible person at the facility during a closeout meeting. I want to spend some time to give our perspective as to why FDA, uh, why 483 response is critical. As we see more often than we should, a conceptual misunderstanding from all types and sizes of firms. Take advantage of this opportunity to provide us with your assessment of these observations, including their impact on the product that is currently in the marketplace and actively being consumed by patients. When an investigator identifies an issue during the limited amount of time, our expectation is that you will take those findings further and investigate if it's systemic, whether it represents a symptom of a larger and more widespread issue, whether it affects other drug products and practices. Your response should include how you assessed impact of these observations on your overall quality system. 
I will talk more about it in upcoming slides. The most important thing during the closeout meeting is for you to assure you understand observations thoroughly. If you do not understand them, chances are likely that you will not be able to adequately respond to them. Ask clarification during the closeout meeting if you do not understand them. If investigator mentions any concern that he or she is not planning to document on 483, but conveys that it's important and that she may document it as part of the discussion item, make note of that and consider providing your response to it as well. We ensure that any response received within 15 business days after the 483 was issued is taken into account while evaluating an inspection and deciding when facility classification, including whether to take a regulatory action, such as a warning letter. In case of more involved observations or complex observations, or for any reason, they are not fully addressed within 15 days, please submit CAPA plan and a proposed timeline for substantive responses. However, we will not ordinarily delay issuance of a warning letter or any other regulatory action in order to review a response that is received more than 15 business days after the 483 was issued. So, what should, what should you include in a 483 response? In a 483 response, what we are looking for is a comprehensive investigation plan, including scope, summary, a list of compromised drug products or products, identified root causes or causes the companies should provide a list of all products in their assessment, both the ones that had problem and the one that didn't. Summarize immediate actions taken to assess risk to patients and actions <clears throat> taken to mitigate them. Respond to each observation with a scientific and risk-based investigation plan that includes the scope of the issue as, as I just outlined, including systemic assessment for similar trend, whether other drugs are affected, other lots, other processes, other equipment, other practices, and so on. Impact assessment on product quality and patient safety. This is very critical in, in determining the scale of the risk. Also, if anything was excluded, any product, any processes, any practices that you believe did not need investigation or are not impacted by the observation, then please include a scientific rationale as to how you determine that. Exclusions needs to be clearly identified and rationalized. And a CAPA plan that is commensurate with the risk, including time frame, milestones, and how you plan to ensure the effectiveness check of the actions taken. So once the inspection is conducted, 483 is issued, you had a chance to respond, we reviewed it, there are likely three out outcomes. One is the most benign, no action indicated. That means no objectionable conditions or practices were found during the inspection, or they were very minor. A voluntary action indicated. That means, yes, there were issues, there were objectionable conditions, but we are not prepared to take any action. We, we, we believe a voluntary opportunity should be given to the manufacturer to correct them. Or the lastly, OAI, the most egregious ones where we would recommend a, a regulatory action. So alternate approaches to inspections during pandemic. As you know, FDA has faced challenges so all of so have so all of you have, and we are also adapting to the limitations imposed by this ongoing pandemic. We have made several adjustments in how we evaluate facilities and operations. We are increasingly using record requests to support uh, to guide future surveillance inspection coverage. We also rely on our mutual reliance agreement partner home country reports for certain scenarios. While we continue to conduct mission critical inspections, that includes breakthrough therapy designated products, drug shortages, 
products used to diagnose, treat, or prevent a serious disease or medical condition for which there is no other appropriate substitute. In determining mission criticality, we also take into account safety of all those involved in the inspection and the public health benefits, clinical benefits, and medical necessity. We closely collaborate with our foreign regulatory counterpart, as I just mentioned, um, and monitor their assessments and regulatory actions for impact on products manufactured at those facilities and distributed to the United States. M MRA between FDA and EU rely upon information from inspections conducted within each other's border, and these are applicable to only surveillance. We have also increased the number of sampling, and as you will see in upcoming slide that I will demonstrate the, the regulatory actions we are able to take based on this tool. Um, we have successfully collaborated and evaluated findings that impact the U.S. bound products. And in addition, we have confidentiality agreements with other countries that allow FDA and other regulatory authorities of those countries to share information about about the drug product. So as you can see, we adapted to changing environment in the pandemic and increased sampling and record requests, as I just stated. During 2017 to 2019, we did not issue any warning letter based on sampling. But since the onset of pandemic, until November 2020, we have issued about 12 such warning letters. Since November, we have also issued one additional warning letter based on a record request. Similarly, uh, we have not issued many import alert based on sampling or records request in the past, but as we adapted, we have issued about 48 import alerts since 2020 based on sampling and about 10 based on record requests. The point being, though an on-site inspection is the most vital, effective, and irreplaceable tool FDA has many additional tools that we can utilize to assure the quality of drug product being presented to the United States for importation. Now I will talk about some of the CGMP deviation themes that we, we, we see. So we analyze data from approximately 43 CGMP warning letters, which included API related observations and found that two most common issues were related to investigations and unauthorized access as part of overall data integrity team. Other issues of note are disclosure of quality information to customers. This is especially for repackers for not transferring all quality related information and, and equipment cleaning, as many of the facilities involved in the API manufacturing use shared equipment. I will talk about investigations and data integrity as they not only appear to be high on the list, but also affect multiple parts of the quality system. Investigations, whether it's production related or laboratory related, appear to be an area which constantly emerges during inspections as a concern. We often see that the, they do not address issues in a systemic way as we see them recurring time to time, though the firm indicates they, they may have implemented corrective action. This suggests that the firm's conclusion fundamentally is not supported by evidence, but merely a symptomatic fix rather than a cure. More often, we see manufacturer take a single retest as an assurance of quality of entire batch rather than conducting a thorough investigation to look for underlying currents that may have caused the failure. One of the themes in laboratory we often see is the firm failing to extend an investigation to manufacturing or phase two when they cannot conclusively identify root cause during a phase one or laboratory investigation. Also, human error is frequently cited as a root cause. We see firms taking the person approach, including coaching or training writing another procedure or adding to the existing one and disciplinary measures, often as corrective actions. We will we fail to see the manufacturers taking system approach that takes into account that humans are failable. 
and that errors are to be expected. The CAPAs do not address or develop system with barriers, safeguards, and redundant operations to make, uh, to make system more robust. I highly encourage everyone um, to familiarize themselves with the out of specification guidance and quality system guidance that um, uh, the links are provided in the box below, uh, which, which outlines some of, some of the expectations um, that the agency has about the investigations. Data integrity. So I want to start by showing this visual that just represents that above 73% of the warning letter issued between years 2016 and 2019 to, F, uh, to API manufacturing facilities had some level of data integrity concerns. And as you can see that when we have data integrity concerns, we take them very seriously. So we see data integrity in many forms, from unreported, deleted, fabricated data, to testing samples into compliance in various ways by either changing sample to a standard, backdating results, aborting runs when results do not seem to seem as expected, rerunning the sample. All data that your firm collects and documents must follow Alcoa principle. They must be attributable, legible, contemporaneous, original or a true copy and accurate. Whenever you are dealing with a DI issue, it is very important, first and foremost, to determine the scope. If you do not start with a proper scope, chances are more than likely the data integrity issues will reappear because you have not, you have not addressed it fundamentally from the root cause uh, perspective. It is very important to determine what systems are impacted and what other systems can have similar problems. Why these issues occurred, whether it was a procedural gap or it was intentional. Once you have the pro proper scope that needs to be followed up with a risk assessment to evaluate the impact of these gaps on the product and patient starting with the existing products that are currently in the market. We often see the firms only look at the product um, that are currently in the market. While that should be the first step, we highly recommend to also go back and look at the data uh, for the product that may, may, may have expired because that can provide a valuable trend or valuable information that could be a missing piece in understanding the root cause. So do not ignore them. Um, once that is understood and you have the risk assessment, um, it is also important to understand the impact on the approved and pending applications and the time frame for such practices. As I stated earlier in the 483 response section, if there are any exclusions, in the scope, you have to determine that based on the scientific and tangible information. Highly recommend looking at the data integrity guidance um, that provides such a great information on this topic. So in summary, we all carry a shared responsibility to ensure patients are provided with the safe and effective drug. This shared responsibility can only be fulfilled if there is a transparency, including transparency in the supply chain, and expectations are clear from the suppliers and service providers in this increasingly global and complex environment. We highly recommend that you look at the ICHQ7 guidelines that outline the basic minimum GMP expectations from the API manufacturers. And with that, thank you so much for listening patiently.